بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respects the listeners As was announced Inshallah I hope to share a few thoughts with you about the topic of Baghda in Arabic which is malice in a hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says it's a hadith related by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in his Musnad and others he says Dabba ilaykum da'u al-umami qablakum al-hasad the disease of the nations of yore has crept into you which is envy والبغضاء هي الحالقة لا أقول تحلق الشعر ولكن تحلق الدين and بغضاء malice, hatred that is the shaver I don't say it shaves hair rather I say it shaves religion والذي نفسي بيده لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمن ولا تؤمن حتى تحاب أفلا أنبئكم بما يثبت ذلك لكم أفش السلام بينكم He continues saying By that Allah in whose hands rests my soul You will never enter Jannah until you believe and you will never believe until you come to love one another. Should I not inform you of that which will establish this love for you? Afshu salam bainakum spread salam amongst you. So that's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it says so much. <coughs> First of all, the disease of the nations of yore. The disease of the earlier nations has crept into you. And that disease is hasad, envy. Envy is destructive. And that's why in the first of the two Mu'awwidatayn, as we know them, the penultimate surah of the Qur'an, from the two famous du'as of قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the dua قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقُ مِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَدْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ and the final one is وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدْ that say I seek refuge in the Lord of the morning break and then the rest in Sharri Ma Khalaq. From the evil of what he has created and from the evil of the night when it spreads and from the evil of the whispers in the knots. And then finally, Women Sharri Hasid in Ida Hasid. And in the evil of the envy when he envies. And it's telling that the words and the evil of the envier when he envies come immediately after وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ And from the evil of the whisperers 
into the knots. That is a reference to sorcery. But hasid can be just as damaging. In fact, hasid is more common. Hasid is far more relevant to most people. It concerns every single one of us. And it's destructive. It's destructive in relations with each other, in the family, in the community, in society. It's destructive to oneself, to one's own soul. It eats up a person from within. And it leaves no good. And that's why a poet says, لِلَّهِ دَرُّ الْحَسَدِ مَا أَعْدَلَ بَدَأَ بِصَاحِبِهِ فَقَتَلَ That to Allah belongs the beauty of envy. To Allah belongs the beauty of envy. Of course, there's no beauty about it. But beauty here means wonder. And not in the positive sense. It's remarkable, but not in the positive sense. It's a thing, it's thought-provoking, but again, not in the positive sense. So, لِلَّهِ ذَرُّ الْحَسَدِ مَا أَعْدَلَ To Allah belongs the wonder of envy. How just is it? How just is envy? بَدَأَ بِصَاحِبِهِ فَقَتَلَهِ It rhymes very well. بَدَأَ بِصَاحِبِهِ فَقَتَلَهِ Envy begins with the envier, and it kills him first. So the remarkable thing is that envy burns a person from within, and it kills him repeatedly, even before it harms the other person. And it can harm, because envy incites a person to certain behaviours with a view to harming the other person. And this escalation is actually mentioned in another hadith in another hadith related from the sahaba radiyallahu anhum who say that once prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was speaking to them and he said how will it be when rome and persia are conquered in one narration, when the treasures of Rome and Persia are conquered. So how will you be? So his question was to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that how will you behave? What will you be like as people when Rome and Persia will be conquered? And in one narration, when their treasures shall be conquered. So one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, we will be as Allah has commanded us, meaning we will be grateful to Allah. That if the treasures of the world open up before us, we will be grateful to Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Awa ghayra dhalik, meaning, will that be the case or will it be something else? And then the Prophet ﷺ told them what he feared would actually happen. And so he said, Prophet ﷺ said, How will you be when the when Rome and Persia or when the treasures of Rome and Persia will be opened up before you. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, we will be as Allah commanded us, i.e. to be grateful. So the Prophet wasallam said, will you really or will it be something else? Will it be this? And then he mentioned, will it be this, that first you will compete with one another. Then you will be envious of one another. Then you will turn away from each other and then you will come to hate one another. So there is an escalation. So hasad, envy, is not victimless and it's not harmless. 
it begins with the person and the person, the envy, suffers first. But eventually, that envy, that hasid, will incite the person to behaving in such a way that will cause genuine harm to other people, whether it's financially, in terms of their name and dignity, or even physically. Hasid will escalate. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says here, first you will compete with one another. The love of the world will lead to competition, rivalry, each one trying to grab as much as possible. And then when this rivalry in worldly things escalates, it then escalates into hasad and envy. And envy won't stop there. Prophet ﷺ said, you will compete with one another. Then you will be envious of one another. And then you will turn away from each other. You'll turn your backs from each other. When people become envious, they will become more and more selfish. They will turn away from each other. And then finally, this turning away will lead to hatred. How does turning away lead to hatred? Could it be the other way around, where people hate one another and then this results in them turning away from each other? No, it can be both ways. The physical act of ignoring others, neglecting others, not socializing with others, not being involved with others, being selfish, being self-concerned, self-immersed, all of these things can lead to suspicions about others and eventually hatred towards others, meeting mixing, breaks barriers, it removes suspicions, it adds that human touch. <coughs> Sometimes two people who have fallen out with each other, they want to meet, they want to mend their relationship, they want to find a common ground, they want to find a path to each other. However, their past disagreement and the aftermath prevents them from doing that. And all they need to do, often, is just meet. And that meeting, with that human touch, melts away so much of that animosity. So when, pe when people do turn away from each other, as the Prophet ﷺ says in this hadith, then you turn away from each other, that lack of communication, that lack of contact, that lack of involvement, that lack of socialising, can actually lead to hatred. It's not just hatred which turns to, leads people to turn away from each other, physically ignoring others, neglecting others, turning away from others, itself can lead to greater hatred. So going back to the first hadith, Prophet ﷺ says, الحسد, The disease of the earlier nations, envy has crept into you. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, And hatred, malice, that is the shame. So the Prophet ﷺ calls malice, which is the topic of today's talk, malice. He calls it the shave. And then he clarifies what he means by the shave. I don't say it shaves hair, it removes hair. Rather, it shaves deen, religion. Which simply means that malice, hatred, will destroy a person's rewards, a person's religion, a person's piety, religiosity. It'll, it'll remove all of these things, leave the person completely bare. Just like shaving removes all traces of the hair and leaves the skin bare and smooth. 
Hatred does the same. And in one narration, the disease that he mentions before, which is Hasid, he describes Hasid as a fire that consumes, the, well, he describes Hasid as consuming deeds just like fire consumes dry wood or dry grass. So the two diseases mentioned in this hadith are Hasid envy and malice. Envy, he says, in another narration, burns a person's deeds, consumes a person's deeds, just like fire consumes dry grass or wood. And malice, hatred, shaves a person's religion, shaves a person's deeds, until one's account of deeds is bare. And there are many ways of understanding this. One of them is, when a person hates someone, they inevitably end up committing a wrong towards them, whether it's verbally or even physically. And in a hadith related by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, addressed the companions radiyallahu anhum and said to them, who is the pauper amongst you? Who's the penniless, poor person amongst you? Who's a destitute? So the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum said, the miskeen, the poor person amongst us, is one who has no dirham or goods. A penniless, destitute, poor person. Someone who owns nothing. That's what we call a miskeen. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the miskeen in reality, the poor person in reality, is one who will come on the day of resurrection with rewards. And then he mentions a few good deeds. He'll come with the reward of prayer and fasting. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, this is my explanation, he mentioned mentions a few deeds. But, Prophet ﷺ says, he will come in such a state that although he has these deeds to his name, he will have قَدْ شَتَمَ هَذَا وَقَذَفَ هَذَا وَأَكَلَ مَالَ هَذَا وَسَفَكَ دَمَ هَذَا He will have in the world, verbally abuse this person. He would have slandered this person. He will have unlawfully consumed the wealth of this person. He would have shed the blood of that person. So the Prophet ﷺ mentions that he may come with good deeds to his name, but at the same time, he would have been guilty of these sins. And as you can see, every one of them has a victim. It's not about, he didn't pray Salah, he failed to fast, he didn't go on pilgrimage. He was weak in belief. He didn't give in zakah or charity. These are all victims of his crimes. So the, funny, the strange thing is, he would have come with lots of reward of salah, of zakah, of charity, of prayer, pilgrimage. He would have come with many rewards of deeds that were between him and Allah. But at the same time, he would have come being guilty of many sins between him and Allah's creation. Slander, verbal abuse, unlawfully appropriating people's wealth, and physically hurting others. So the Prophet says, what will happen? 
He says, this person, since he mentioned that he will have unlawfully consumed the wealth of this person, verbally abused this person, slandered this person, physically hurt this person, Prophet ﷺ says, this person will be given from his good deeds, and this person will be given from his good deeds. هَذَا مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ وَهَذَا مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ That this person will be given good deeds from his account, and that person will be given good deeds from his account. Until when his good deeds expire, Prophet ﷺ says, when his good deeds expire and he can't be compensated, Sorry, the wronged victims cannot be compensated from his deeds, but their account remains unsettled. Prophet ﷺ says, their sins will be taken from him and thrust on him. That's how their accounts will be settled. And this was a person who came with many good deeds. It's a hadith of Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ says here, who's the poor person amongst you? Sahaba radiallahu said, the poor person amongst us is one who has no dirham and no possessions. So the Prophet ﷺ reminded them that in reality that's not a poor person. The poor person is someone who comes loaded with good deeds and the rewards of these good deeds between him and Allah. But having wronged so many people, and then these wronged victims will have their account settled by Allah, for he is just. And how will that be? Litigation. All his victims will be compensated from his deeds. And if he becomes bankrupt, he can't say, I don't have anything anymore. If he becomes bankrupt of good deeds, and his account expires of good deeds, Rasulullah says, their sins will be taken from them and thrust upon his shoulders. So he will be in a great loss. The very person who came with so much will now be in a great loss. This is how the Prophet ﷺ says, Baghdad hatred is the shaver. I don't say it shaves hair, rather it shaves religion. This is how it shaves religion. Completely wipes a person's account of good deeds clean. Why? Because inevitably, that hatred will bubble and rage within, and it won't allow the person to remain settled. It will lead him to saying something, to doing something, that will harm the other person. Hatred is not neutral. Hatred does not remain settled. It agitates the person. It incites a person to action, whether that action is verbal or physical. It may lead a person to abusing another, slandering another, seeking to harm another, another's name or dignity, unlawfully consuming the wealth of another, or even physically harming the other. Hatred doesn't remain silent. That's what it does. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, hatred, malice, is the shave. It shaves a person's religion. Completely wipes it clean. And then the Prophet ﷺ continues that by Allah in whose hands rest my soul, you will never enter Jannah until you believe, and you will never believe until you come to love one another. There can be no Iman without love. And should I not tell you of what will establish this for you, meaning this love? which leads to faith, and faith which leads to Jannah. Afshu salam baynakum. Spread salam amongst you. Spread salam amongst you. In fact, in one hadith, Prophet says, 
give salam to those you know as well as those you don't know. Whether you know the person or not, you greet them with salam. So spread salam amongst you. Remove malice. Malice is in the heart, but it eventually leads to hurt and hate. And going back to the other hadith, the one Prophet Sallallahu says, how will you be when the treasures of Persia and Rome will be opened up to you? He's addressing the Sahaba, the companions of Abiy Allah Anhum. And they said, we will do as Allah has commanded us, which is to be grateful. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, will you really do this? Is that, how, is that how you will be? Or will it be something else? And what's that something else? Or will it be the case that you will compete with each other in the world, in the dunya? Then you will come to envy one another. Then you will come to turn away from each other. And then you will hate one another. There's a gradual progress. There is a process. We think hatred we often think when we hear of these sins that this doesn't affect me. Hasid, I don't have a hasid. I'm not envious. Bugd, Baghda, hatred, I don't harbor hatred. We may think that I don't harbor hatred. In fact, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they say that, well, if I relate the story, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi relates to the hadith in his Musnad, that one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was seated with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, a man will appear before you now who is of the people of Jannah. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum began looking. And a man came out with his sandals hanging from a strip, with a strip from his hand, and with water dripping from his limbs, because he had just completed wudu. The next day, the Prophet wasallam said again, again to them, that a man will appear before you, who is of the people of Jannah. And the same man came out, same way, water dripping from his limbs, sandals in his hand. Third day, the Prophet ﷺ said the same, that a man will appear before you who is of the people of Jannah. So the Sahabi came out. So what, on the third occasion, a companion stood up and followed him. And speaking to him, he requested to stay with him at his house as a guest. So the Sahabi radiallahu an, the one with wudu and sandals, the one who was of the people of Jannah, he agreed and he accepted that you may stay at my house. And this Sahabi radiallahu an, his intention was that he wanted to see what, it, what, what is it about this particular companion which leads the Prophet Sallallahu to say he is of the people of Jannah. So he says, I stayed with him for three days, observing what he does at home in the privacy of his house. Because outside, we never knew anything about him. He wasn't one of the famous leading companions, nor was he doing anything that was of note to anyone. So maybe he did something in his house. So he says, for three days I observed him. And he says, after three days I saw nothing. T 
to the extent that I began belittling his deeds, thinking that he doesn't do anything. He wouldn't fast, pray. Of course, he prays his obligatory prayers outside in the masjid. But at home, no excessive salah or fasting. He says the only thing I saw him do is that at night, when he would awaken briefly, he'd take the name of Allah and go back to sleep. So he said, after the third day, I confronted him and I said to him, look, the reality is I had no need to stay as a, as a guest at your house, but my intention was to observe you closely, to see what you do. Because the Prophet wasallam said of you repeatedly that you are one of the people of Jannah. So what is it that you do? I said, I haven't seen you do anything. So what do you do? The Sahabi radiallahu anhu said, I do what, I, what you have seen me do, nothing more. This is what it is. Then he said, however, there is one thing which I do maintain. So the Sahabi radiallahu anhu said, what is that? So he said, I'm sure that I do not harbour any envy in my heart for any favour that Allah has bestowed upon anyone. I do not envy anyone what Allah has given them. And then he added, and I do not harbour any malice or hatred in my heart towards any believer. So the other Sahabi radiallahu anhu said, this is something we can't reach. This is something we cannot attain. This is it. Now I remember that because, this, because of this last sentence. We think that envy doesn't affect me. I'm not envious. Baghdad, my heart is clean. I don't harbor any hatred. That's what we think. But the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would say, this is something that we can't achieve. They were honest. So it's something we have to actually work on. If we deny it, there's nothing to address. And it will continue to shave away. Shave our deen, our religion, our deeds. There are many verses in the Qur'an, directly or indirectly related to this. And the hadith are many. In one hadith, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked by the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum. They said, Ayyun nasi afdal? Who is the best of all people? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kullu makhmoom al-qalb saduq al-lisan. Every makhmoom of the heart, honest of tongue, so I haven't translated mahmoom because even the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum didn't know what mahmoom meant. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyun nasi afdal, who is the best of all people? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu mahmoom al-qalb saduq al-lisan. Every mahmoom hearted person and every honest tongued person. So they said, Saduq al na'rifu. That honest of tongue we know. But who or what is makhmoom al qalb? <coughs> who or what is makhmoom al qalb? That you've just mentioned that he is the best of all people. Someone who's makhmoom of qalb, of heart, and truthful of tongue. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كُلُّ تَقِيٍّ نَقِيٍّ لَا إِثْمَ فِيهِ وَلَا بَغْيَ وَلَا غِلَّ وَلَا حَسَد Beautiful hadith. So he gave the definition of مخموم القلب. Now you could translate it as pure of heart. But even the Sahaba رضي الله عنه never understood that word. So they said, who is the best of all people? He said, كُلُّ مخموم القلب صدوق اللسان Every pure makhmum of heart, 
honest of tongue. So it's like honest of tongue we know. But مخموم القلب, what's مخموم القلب? So the Prophet وسلم, defined مخموم of heart. He said, كل تقي نقي لا إثم فيه ولا بغي ولا غل ولا حسد. The مخموم hearted person is every pious, God-fearing, كل تقي, God-fearing, نقي, clean, pure person. لا إثم فيه in whom there is no sin. وَلَا بَغْيَ And no transgression. وَلَا غِلَّ And no rancor or malice. وَلَا حَسَدْ And no envy. He is the best of all. And that's something very difficult to achieve. To ensure that one's heart is pure of envy, pure from envy, pure from غِل, hatred, malice. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that that's something we actually need to pray for. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiyallahu anhu used to say that there are three verses, three grades of people, and he was referring to the three verses of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Hashr. There are three grades of people. The first two have gone, they have disappeared. You only have a hope of being in the third group. The first two have gone. So strive to be of the third group. And which three groups are they? First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the muhajirun, the emigrants from Mecca to Medina. They were the elite amongst the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Allah says that wealth that the Prophet ﷺ was given, this was for the benefit of the emigrant poor individuals who were driven from their homes and from their wealth, seeking Allah's grace and bounty and His pleasure. They assist Allah. And his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these are the truthful ones. So this is the first group. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu says, this first group has disappeared. You can never ever hope to be of the first group. Nor can you hope to be of the second group. And the second group is the Ansar of whom Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْحِحُونَ Allah says, and those who occupied the city and who adopted Iman from before the city of Medina, he's speaking about the Ansar. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They love those who have emigrated to them. And that really meant something. The Muhajirun, who had travelled from Mecca to Medina, as Allah describes them, they were driven from their homes and their wealth. Many of them arrived poor and needy. Penniless, without shelter, without refuge. So the people of Medina had to receive them. And I don't like using the word, but to help us understand, as in today's context, as refugees, those who have fled persecution, who have been driven from their homes, who have left behind their wealth, their belongings, who may have been wealthy before, but who now arrive, having had to abandon everything, and they are in great need. So what was the response of the Ansar in Medina to these people? SubhanAllah. The Prophet wasallam made them brothers. They shared their wealth, and their belongings, and their orchards, and not only that, 
But as Allah testifies, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ It says a lot. They love those who emigrated to. They didn't just tolerate them. They didn't just assist them. They didn't just not consider them a burden. They went much further. They actually showed and experienced and expressed genuine love for them. And that was selfless, that was remarkable. And it wasn't just initially. It remained till the end. Because Allah then describes, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرِ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they do not harbour any reservation at what they have been given. What does that sentence mean? Meaning, not only did the Ansar love the Muhajirun initially, but from the very beginning, the Prophet Wasallam always showed privilege and preference to the Muhajir. So when he was seated, in the front of his gathering, seats were reserved, places were reserved for the leading Muhajir. When he led Salah, it was mainly the leading Muhajirun who stood immediately behind. When he consulted the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, first and foremost, primarily, he would consult the Muhajirun, the emigrants. At each turn, at each juncture, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave preference and privilege to the Muhajirun in many ways. And the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhu could see that. That we are the indigenous people of Medina. This is our city. These are our homes. We have welcomed them in our homes, in our city. We have shared our wealth with them. And yet, they have been given privilege. They have been given preference. They have always been given priority. So what was their reaction? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They love those who emigrated to them, not just at the beginning, but even later. And they do not harbor any reservation in their hearts at what they, meaning the muhajirun, have been given. So the ansar do not harbor any reservation in their hearts at what the muhajirun have been given. So even though they would see that they would have been given privilege and preference and priority, they harbored no envy, no malice, no rancor, no hatred, not even any reservation. Not even any reservation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues praising the Ansar, وَيُثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ That they give privilege to others over themselves, even though they may be suffering from hunger. وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And whoever is protected from the greed of his soul, then these are the ones who are successful. And indeed Allah had removed all shuh, all avarice and greed from the hearts of the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And only then could they be like this. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, this was the second group. You can never be of the first, the Muhajirun. You can never be of the Ansar, for both have disappeared. You can only ever hope to be of the third group. Therefore, strive to be of the third group. And what's the third group? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ This is the third verse. After the Muhajirun and the Ansar, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ And those who came after them, يَقُولُونَ They say, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا O oh, our Lord, forgive us. وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Forgive us and those of our brothers who have preceded us in faith. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ And do not create any ghil, any rancor or malice in our hearts for the believers. O oh, our Lord, you are the most compassionate, you are the most merciful. This is why I said, it's not easy cleansing our hearts of malice, of hatred. We have to work on it and pray for it. And this is what Allah teaches us. And as Sa'id ibn Abi Waqas says, the Muhajirun, their hearts were clear. The Ansar, their hearts were clear. The first two groups have disappeared. 
you have no hope of ever belonging to those two groups. The most you can ever achieve is to belong to this third group, and for that you must strive, you must work. And that third group is those who harbour no rancour, no malice or hatred in their hearts, neither for their predecessors or for their contemporaries. To be clean of heart, one has to actually work towards it and pray for it in order to achieve it. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhu, their hearts were clean. The same Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiyallahu of whom I've just spoken, who, who says of these three verses that you can never belong to the first two groups, they have disappeared, only the third. He himself, he was a military commander, and Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu was another military commander. On one occasion, they both had a disagreement. They fell out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of these two groups, and we know of them, that they were clean-hearted. That's what we believe of. And yet, we know that they disagreed with one another. They argued. And one of the reasons, so how do we reconcile these two? It's very simple. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were a very, in fact the Arabs in general, were a very unpretentious people. What you see is what you got. They meant what they said. They said what they meant. They weren't overly diplomatic. And amongst themselves, they shunned titles, labels. Today, when we speak of each other, we always give one another titles. If it's just... If we don't know each other, then it's brother and sister. Brother. Everyone's a brother, everyone's a sister. So it's a common title. And when we address senior people, again, there are titles and labels. And when it comes to scholars and imams and teachers, some people like to make a point of saying only their name. But often, we attach many prefixes and suffixes to their titles. But the Arabs originally, they were never like that. And if you look at the Sahaba, none of them had titles. They all addressed each other by their first name or by their kunya, by their tetan. They would name they would be given a kunya based on their eldest child. Or often it would be the eldest child, but it's not always necessary. In fact, Prophet Sallallahu kunya was Abu Al-Qasim. And Umm Al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, she had no kunya because she had no children. Well, sorry, she had no children, but the Prophet Sallallahu gave her the kunya Umm Abdullah. That was her kunya. Based on her nephew, Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhumah, the son of Zubayr ibn al-Awwam and her sister, Asma radiyallahu anha. So, the Arabs, Abu Bakr radiyallahu an, his kunyah was Abu Bakr, his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Quhatha. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an would often be called Abu Hafs. So, Ali radiyallahu an, Abu al-Hassan. So the Arabs love the kunyah. So the most, they, they were very open with each other. They called each other by their first names. And if there was more affection, more closeness, they'd address each other by their kunya. But hardly any titles. They gave titles to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And in fact, even when it came to the title of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa you will see in the books of hadith, they weren't extensive titles. They'd simply say, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
He himself never gave himself titles. And yet his simplicity was sublime. When he wrote that letter to Heraclius, the emperor of Rome, he was the emperor of Byzantine Rome, who had just recently vanquished the Persians. And the Prophet وسلم, wrote him a letter. And traditionally, emperors would attach so many titles to their names. Lord of the East and the West, and Son of the Sun, and Master of the Realms, and such and such. But when the Prophet وسلم, wrote that letter, it was so simple yet so sublime. من محمد عبد الله ورسوله إلى هرقل عظيم الروم From Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger, to Heraclius, the great one of Rome. من محمد عبد الله ورسوله And the Prophet وسلم, was very balanced. There was simplicity and humility in that letter. Yet, even though he was addressing Heraclius, the Emperor of Rome, the Prophet وسلم, was in no way insinuating any inferiority or submission. Rather, it was humility, but with confidence. So what were his words? From Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger, to Heraclius, the great one of Rome, Aslim Taslam. Embrace Islam, you shall be safe. I've commented on that in detail in the hadith of Heraclius, uh, hadith of Heraclius, so we'll refer to that. But... The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they wouldn't address Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with grand titles. The most they would say is, Ya Rasulullah. And, or, Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. May, may my parents be your ransom or messenger of Allah. Otherwise, the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum amongst themselves, no fancy titles. They wouldn't even call themselves brother. You, you hardly ever see. Brother Fula, Brother Fula amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, never the case. In fact, not just amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, but even their students, and even their students. So when you look in the books of Hadith, most of the books of Hadith, well, not all, but many, the most famous period of the compilation of Hadith was in the 3rd century of Hijrah. So... Almost 300 years after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or should we say 200 years in the third century, 200 years. So the most famous authors of Hadith, these were the. This was a period in which they lived and in which they produced their books. So Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, his probably one of the more famous but earlier ones. He died in 179 Hijri. But very few hadith in his collection. And then you have Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He died in 241 Hijri. And then Imam Bukhari, 256. A year before him, Imam Darmi, 255. Imam Muslim, five years after Imam Bukhari, 261. And then... Ibn Majah 273, Abu Dawood 275, Tirmidhi 279, Nasai 303, and so on. Ibn Khuzayma 311, Bahawi 321. So these are the most famous authors of hadith in their collections. But they're all in that third century. But speaking of just these authors, in these books, sometimes you find nine narrators between them and the Prophet. Sometimes three or four or five. 
the fewest are three, four. On average, five, six, sometimes even eight or nine. So despite having nine narrators, eight narrators, from these authors all the way 200, 200 years or more after the Prophet ﷺ, you won't find any titles in any of the narrations. Shaykh Fula, our Fula, our Hadra, our Imam, nothing. All you find is just the name. So this tradition of having just names without any titles, even for great scholars, this was this continued all the way for, for a few centuries after the Prophet. Of course, they would be given titles, but not in everyday use. So the Arabs were always a very unpretentious people. And that meant that with them, you got what you saw, they said what they meant, they meant what they said. And that means if they had disagreements, they'd bring them out into the open. And they would. Sahaba radiallahu anhu were like that. We learned at the beginning of Surah Al Hujarat that Abdu, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu both had a disagreement. They raised their voices at each other in the presence of the Messenger. And there were a number of incidents like that. Once Abu Bakr and Umar had words. And Abu Bakr came to the Prophet And Prophet saw that he's upset. And Umar came because he knew that Abu Bakr will go to the Prophet And he feared. And then it's a long, well, it's a story, but the Prophet ﷺ said to, when he learned that Umar had words with Abu Bakr, Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, not just addressing Umar, but all of the Sahaba, saying, I tell you, leave my companion alone. Abu Bakr, leave my companion alone. But the Sahaba had disagreements, they had words with each other. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas radiyallahu anhu, he was a military commander. And Khalid ibn Walid radiyallahu anhu was a military commander and they had a disagreement on one occasion. And the disagreement was so strong that they both raised their voices at each other. And they parted. So Khalid radiyallahu anhu went and Sa'ad radiyallahu anhu came this way. And they had just had a strong disagreement in which they actually raised voices at each other. So someone who harbored ill towards Khalid ibn al-Walid he thought that this is a brilliant opportunity to explore it. So maybe I can say a few negative words about Khalid ibn al-Walid to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So he sought that opportunity. And he began saying something to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas about Khalid ibn al-Walid. And they had just had their strong disagreement. Instantly, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu stopped him in his tracks. And said to him, do not speak ill of Khalid in front of me. We may have had our disagreement, but our disagreement does not affect our deen. Or our hearts. And that's in, indeed, that's how the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were. Once someone approached one of the companions and said that you have disagreed with the other group and yet your disagreement is so strong that you have fought each other. So what do you say of that? So he recited the verse of the Qur'an, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُرٍ مُتْقَابِلِينَ Speaking of Jannah, that we shall extract all rancor from their hearts. They shall recline on couches facing each other as brothers. <clears throat> so this is how the Sahaba were. Hatred in Islam is about ensuring that our hearts are free from hatred. It doesn't mean we have to be one in everything, in opinion, in speech, in appearance, 
in dress, in likes and tastes. We can disagree. We can hold different and variant opinions. We can have different tastes and likes. We can have different directions and preferences. We can strongly disagree about something, no matter how passionately we feel about it. But in all of these things, we can, it's impossible and unrealistic to be uniform in these things, especially in opinions, in views and opinions and sayings, even in our practice an observation of religion. What matters is that the heart should be pure of rancor and hatred. So do not be hypocritical. Hypocrisy and being pretentious is that a person attempts to appear one and uniform and conceals one's true feelings towards the other. And says whatever needs to be said in order to please and appease the other. And yet harbour suspicion, rancour, hatred in one's heart. This is what is frowned upon in the Qur'an and in the Hadith. Strongly. And this is why the Sahaba of the Allah They were very open. They would say what needed to be said. And if, if, they, were, if they had words with each other... As soon as they had their disagreement, or even their argument, they'd forget. They would not allow it to fester within. And this is what's dangerous. This is Baghdad. Prophet ﷺ had disagreements with his wives. Abu Bakr he once heard his daughter Aisha عنها, speaking to the Prophet وسلم, and saying something to him in a manner which he disapproved of strongly. So he actually went towards her, warning her. The Prophet وسلم, came in between. And then later, Abu Bakr heard both of them, Prophet ﷺ and Aisha radiallahu anha. In full agreement, talking to each other very normally. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhumah said to them, Include me in your peace just as you included me earlier in your war. So Prophet ﷺ had disagreements with his wives. Disagreements are natural. But once that disagreement has been had, it's it's been aired, then we shouldn't allow it to fester. We shouldn't harbour ill will. We shouldn't let it rot in our hearts, creating further problems. This is how the Sahaba عنهم, were utterly unpretentious. Utterly. And this is what, be, what we have been taught by Allah and His Rasul Free your heart from rancour and hatred. Because hatred is not neutral. It's not settled, it agitates, and it incites a person to committing sins and crimes and actually harming another person in many different ways. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to understand. May Allah cleanse and purify our hearts of hatred and inner rage. In many ways, even psychologically and emotionally, it's far better to let go. It requires so much energy to hate, to rage from within, to harbour hate. 
And sometimes we may argue, well, he said this, she said this, he did this, she did this. But what does it achieve? We hurt ourselves. And look at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. We know his story very well. His cousin, Mistah, falsely accused his daughter of a great sin. And she was the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and therefore the cousin of Mistah. She was like her niece to him. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was Mistah's benefactor. He was his guardian in many ways, his benefactor. He spent on him, he provided for him. In fact, according to some narrations, the very house in which he lived belonged to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So he was living in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's provided house. And he was a, he was a poor individual. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would spend on him. So he lived under the roof of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He lived on the maintenance and the provision of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was his cousin. And how did it appear that he rewarded all of this grace, bounty, and generosity with slander? So one can imagine how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu felt. So when he heard this, when he learned of this, he said, by Allah, I will never spend a single dirham again on mislah till the day I die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that verse of Surah Al-Nur, part of the verse. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُو الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَسْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ That's, let not the people of bounty and grace amongst you. Swear and take an oath and vow that they will not give to, their, to the relatives and to the poor and to the emigrants in the way of Allah. Rather, they should excuse, overlook, and forgive. Do you not wish that Allah forgive you your sins? And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he heard the, the, this verse, he began weeping. And he said, Bala, of course, I wish that Allah forgives me my sins. And then immediately he said, By Allah, till the day I die, I will never again withhold a single dirham from this land. And the verse is remarkable in that it teaches us how to remove hatred. Simple, focus on the positive. Ignore the negative. Focus on the positive. Ignore the negative. That's a practical way of removing hatred from our heart. And before I continue about this verse, let me give you an example of another hadith of Bukhari. Umar about ignoring the negatives. Well, you can't always ignore the negatives, but you should allow the positives to overlook the negatives. Imam Bukhari actually relates a hadith from Umar radiallahu anhu. That there was a man amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhu who used to make the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laugh. And he was nicknamed Wakanu Yulakabu Himar. He was nicknamed a donkey. Because he used to play practical jokes as well. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tolerated him, he humored him. And in Bukhari, all that's mentioned is that there was a man called Abdullah, that was his name, Abdullah. But his nickname was Himar. And that's because of his antics and his behavior. He unfortunately earned that nickname. And he used to play jokes on people, even to the Prophet And the Prophet he humored him, he tolerated him. 
And th- this isn't mentioned in Bukhari. Sorry. Let me explain the words of Bukhari to you. There was a man, Umar radiallahu anhu says there was a man called Abdullah who was nicknamed the donkey. He would make the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laugh. And then I'm relying on other narrations and other books and explaining how would he make the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smile, laugh. And why was he called a donkey? He used to play, he used to play practical jokes on people. Even with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not once, not twice, he used to do something regularly. Which is that he used to go and buy something from the marketplace. Or if there was a visiting trader who came in from outside the city, he used to go and buy things from him. And he says, this is my name, this is who I am. Uh, I, let me take it off you, I'll pay you later. So people, tra- people, if they agree, then they would give it to him on credit so that he could pay later. And then he used to come and give the gift of what he had just purchased to the Prophet Sallallahu saying, Ya Rasulullah, this is my gift to you. The Prophet Sallallahu would accept it. And then the creditor would come to him and say, I'd like payments now of what you purchased. So if he was with the Prophet ﷺ, he would take him to the Prophet ﷺ and say, Ya Rasulullah, pay him his money. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ would say to him that you gave me that as a gift, as a hadiyah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have the money. So the Prophet ﷺ, the most he would do was smile and actually pay. And he wouldn't do that once, he would do that occasionally, more than once. So he used to buy gifts, give it to the Prophet wasallam, and then when it came to pay, he'd actually say to the Prophet pay him, pay him. So he would make the Prophet wasallam laugh. But unfortunately, he had a weakness, which is that he would drink. Now going back to the Hadith of Bukhari, Umar radiallahu anhu says that one day he was brought again before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a state of intoxication, meaning having drunk. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to them, punish him, discipline him. So they fell upon him, disciplining him. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, someone said, and we learn from another narration that the speaker was himself. He actually said it himself. He said, Allahumma la'an. He said, oh Allah, curse him. How disgraceful is this? How disgraceful is he? That time and time again he is brought before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and disciplined, yet he does not desist. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, Allahumma la'an. O oh Allah, curse him. What was the Prophet's response, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, La tal'anu. Do not curse him. For what I do know of him is that he loves Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, overlooked the very sin for which he was brought before him. And he declared, even to Umar radiallahu anhu, that do not curse. Even though he was the joke. People had nicknamed him the donk. And he was brought in a state of inebriation. And Umar radiallahu anhu in his anger saying, Ma how disgraceful is he? Time and time again he's brought before the messenger. Yes, he never learns, he never desists. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa could have remained silent. Instead, he said, do not curse him. For what I know of him is that he loves Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. So going back to that verse, that verse teaches us how to forgive, how to release hatred, and that is by overlooking the negatives 
and focusing on the positives. Now, how does the verse teach us that? SubhanAllah. And I end with this. Look at what Mr. had done. He had slandered and perpetuated the slander against his niece, against his benefactor's daughter, against his older brother, it was his cousin brother, so older brother's daughter, against his own niece, against the wife of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that meant harming the household of the Messenger of Allah. It meant damaging the dignity of the house of the Messenger of Allah. That was his guilt. And yet, does Allah mention any of it? No. This is what Allah says. Allah doesn't say, let not the people of bounty and grace amongst you, referring to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Let them, not for, let them not swear an oath that they will not give to those who are guilty or those who have committed this sin. No. Allah says, and let not the people of bounty and grace vow that they will not give to. And then Allah mentions three things. All of them are about mistah. That they will not give to their to the relatives. Wal masakin. So Allah reminds Abu Bakr radiallahu an that regardless of what he has done, remember, he is your relative. So let not the people of grace and bounty swear that they will not give to the relatives. Wal masakin and to the poor. Reminding Abu Bakr radiallahu an, regardless of what Mr. has done, remember, one, he's your relative, two, he is needy, he is poor. And number three, wal muhajireen fi sabirillah, and the emigrants in the way of Allah. That remember, he is after all one of the muhajirun. Allah doesn't mention anything else, no negatives. Regardless of what Mr. had done, he appealed to all the positive and graceful sentiments of Abu Bakr The love of one's relatives, the love of the poor and needy, the love of the muhajirun and their recognition. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised Abu Bakr And I mentioned that Abu Bakr because he had every right to feel aggrieved. It wasn't a minor thing. Yet Abu Bakr radiallahu an instantly forgave. Instantly. That is how we should be removing Bugd and Baghda from our hearts. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru kuntum.